Well, good evening. <laughs> and I welcome you all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's lovely to see you. Thanks for coming out tonight. Let's just open in prayer. Father, we just thank you and praise you for your goodness and for your grace and your mercy to us as Lord. And as we come tonight, we just come to your word, Father. And we pray that you'll just open our hearts to, to see, Lord, that which you have prepared in advance for us to see, Lord. That, that this whole scenario leading up to this great tribulation, Lord, is, is within your will, Lord. It's not within the will of man or, or the devices of the devil, Lord. This is your plan for judgment upon this earth. So be with us, Lord, and bless us in Jesus' name. We looked at chapter 16 in Revelation the last time and tonight, probably just in chapter 17. I was going to do 17 and 18, but there's that much stuff in both of them that it would be, we would be here for a while. Um, so we come away with the idea that, you know, that... Revelation 1 and 19 lays out the, the plan for us and that it's, uh, John was asked to write down that which he had seen, that which is now and that which is yet to come or come hereafter, Metatouta. And uh, we saw in chapter 1 the risen Christ that John's, these were the things that he had seen. In chapter 2 uh, and 3 the things which are, which was the seven letters to the churches, which basically took in the whole epoch of church history and, and really if anything is, is really important within the book of Revelation it's those two chapters those two chapters lay out for us the, sort of, the, the church history um, in, in two chapters and then of course chapter 4 sees the church in heaven after these things that's the first word that's used in chapter 4 which is metatouta um, after what things after the church age that uh, we see the church in heaven and then 4 and 5 shows us the saints in heaven and from chapter 6 onwards we're in this great tribulation that would be coming upon the earth now coming upon the earth not specifically to judge the earth but specifically to judge Israel for their lack of understanding and their lack of acceptance of the Messiah the fact that the whole world gets dragged into it is a, is a mere sideshow but it really is the uh, the judgment upon upon Israel. That, that's initially what, what the whole thing's about. The whole world ends up getting judged because of their, their Christ-hating, God-hating attitude. But uh, the Old Testament refers to the tribulation as Jacob's trouble. And, uh, and it certainly is. In the midst of all the controversies and what's going on at the moment in the world... Israel seems to be always in the mix. It doesn't matter what's happening anywhere in the world. Israel seems to have some role in what's going on. But we've looked at chapter 16 there. We saw the, the, the decline of the world. We saw that the seven seal judgments been opened uh, way back earlier in the book. We saw the seven trumpets being blown earlier in the book. And... Uh, and these, are the, these were the bold judgments now. In chapter 16 it basically lines out for us that the last judgments of God upon the earth, these will literally be happening as Christ comes back to the earth with us and with all the saints in heaven to, to come up against the Antichrist and his forces in the final, the final Armageddon battle. Now, although that's laid out for us in chapter 16, God then goes on to show us in chapter 17 and 18 just how the great tribulation will fall or, or, or make itself, um, what, what would we say, illuminate itself uh, in respect to the false religion that's in the world and, expect, and in respect to the great commercial system that's in the world. In chapter 17 we're going to look at Babylon, the mystery Babylon in the respect of the, the uh, spiritual aspects of the destruction of the world and in chapter 18 we're going to look at Babylon the great, as being the great city that is the commercial heart of the world system at the present time so first of all we're going to look at the sort of spiritual heart of it here 
and we're going to get quite controversial on it so we might end up having to edit the tape but I don't really know how this is going to work out so we start here after chapter 16 we've had this we've had outlined to us this great final judgment of God the seven bowl judgments that have been poured out upon the earth that brought sores and all sorts of things and we looked at that from the point of view nuclear exchanges etc the earth at this point in time is in a total disastrous state there is virtually nothing left and as the Holy Spirit here tries to lay out to us here that the destruction of the spiritual system took place somewhere around the middle of the tribulation period and the destruction of the the commercial system took place in Revelation 18 right at the very very end but we'll see that as we get into it so the seven angels with the seven bowls and chapter 17 and verse 1 it says one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls said to me come I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits on the many waters with her the kings of the earth committed adultery and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries now when the Bible talks about prostitutes or harlots here these are very much Old Testament type of language it's really it's not in some measure to do with the sexual sins of, of, of kings or whatever although that may be part of it but it's certainly to do with idolatry if you look in the Old Testament you'll find that, that Harlotry and, and prostitution deals basically with idolatry. So we've got this great. He's going to show the, the angel's going to show John the punishment that the great prostitute who sits on many waters. Now, the many waters indicates that the peoples of the earth that are left on the earth, the peoples who have not accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, those who will be in this great tribulation. So that we've got this. We've got this religious system, this great prostitute, a religious system that has been very much acceptable to the whole of the earth. Not those who have accepted Jesus Christ at this point in time. Those who accepted Jesus Christ before the rapture or before their own deaths are, are now in heaven and are safely ensconced in heaven. You and I. Uh, but these are the people who have accepted this false religion and right from the very start Satan has tried to to counterfeit that which is uh, the true path to God and we'll see that as we continue through this this chapter there's a great counterfeit going on and and this great prostitute is part of it and the the inhabitants of the earth the earth dwellers as some of the, the Bibles would talk about now don't be confused you and I are not earth dwellers we are citizens of heaven. Uh, the earth dwellers are those who are not citizens of heaven. Those who will be uh, part of this great tribulation. So, so don't get confused. When we talk about earth dwellers or those who live in the earth, they're not talking about us. We, our home is not on the earth. We are pilgrims here at the present time. And uh, as I've said before in other studies, pilgrims are people with a purpose. They've got a goal in mind. And our goal is to serve our Lord and to be with Him eternally. So we are not earth dwellers. And it says here in verse 3, Then the angel carried me away in the spirit into a desert, and there I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names, and had seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. She held a golden cup in her hand filled with abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. So, the first thing we notice here is that there's, there's a, a beast, a scarlet beast. Now, this is obviously the beast of Revelation 13, the beast that came out of the sea. The, the, the seven heads and the ten horns. But this time we see the beast not just as a beast on its own, but of a woman astride the beast, riding the beast. So that tells us two things. This, this great prostitute, this adulterous religion, is riding on the back of the Antichrist government because the beast was representative of the government of the Antichrist. And, and we'll touch on that as well as we go through this as, as the angel sort of explains things to us. But seven heads and ten horns 
and this great beast. So we've, we've got the, the picture here of a desert. Uh, and a desert is, be, is pictured there because the world is desolate by this time. There's nothing left. It's, it's very much a, a, a world that's going down the drain, both physically, materially and spiritually. And we see this, this woman riding this beast. Now, if, if we get this picture, the government of the Antichrist is, is supporting this, this false religion. Uh, by the very fact that it's, the false religion is sitting on the back of the government of the Antichrist. I mean, we've all heard the term getting any power on the back of somebody else's, uh, somebody else's actions. So this is what's happening here. But there's also a, a connotation here that if this woman is riding the beast, she's also controlling the beast in some measure. That, and, and that's in some measure what we saw before, that the kings of the earth committed adultery with this, this uh, prostitute, and they were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. So we get a picture here that this false religion is very much a part of the government of the Antichrist. Indeed, the false religion is being used to subdue and subject all the peoples of the earth that are left uh, to this false religion. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet. Well, if you look at purple and scarlet, purple and scarlet certainly are the, the, the colours of authority. In John's day when he wrote this, purple and scarlet would have been considered to be very, very expensive. The, the dyes to make purple and scarlet cloth were extremely expensive. So if you were running around with purple and scarlet cloth, then you were, you were well off. So it gives us the impression here that the woman, this false religion, was dressed in purple and scarlet. And of course if we look at that we can see that in Roman Catholicism we see that the archbishops are dressed in purple and the cardinals are dressed in scarlet uh, and very much uh, uh, glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. It's very much a, 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 a false religion in that sense that where the money should be getting spent it hasn't been spent and it's been spent on literally world trivialities. And she held a golden cup in her hand filled with abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. I don't know whether you've ever noticed but um, if you see any of the papal masses and I watched one the other day because I wanted to find some information from it and it was, it was a golden cup that they held uh, and it was, only, it was only him who was allowed to drink from it. Nobody else was allowed to drink the wine from the golden cup. So, in some measure we see it, and we'll see it developing here. That, and I'm not saying that the Roman Catholicism is the only woman that rides the beast, but there's going to be a great ecumenical movement towards a one world religion, where it doesn't really matter what you believe, as long as you believe something, that they'll pull you in. If you want to be brought into this great ecumenicalism, then they'll take you into it. We see that in, in the sense that uh, I think it was Pope John Paul II said that you know Buddhists and Muslims etc and, and Hindus all had an equal right to access to God or basically worse to that effect when he was still alive and this current Pope Benedict XVI is certainly very much into to ecumenicalism so it's something that we have to be careful of because at the end of the day uh, if we start getting into bed with this type of stuff, and it's happening within the churches, it's even happening within the evangelical churches today, that they're starting to revert to even the sort of Eastern mysticisms, the, the yogas and, and, and the sort of Kundalini yogas, which is, and they think it does them no harm, but Kundalini is, is, the, is a word that means serpent, and uh, so you've got this image of, uh, all these positions that you take in yoga are actually positions for a, a serpent either at rest or ready to strike or in a, in a provocative position. So we have to be very, very careful even as an evangelical church that we don't get sucked in. There's a movement going around in America at the moment called the Emergent Church 
and they tend to, although they talk of themselves as being emergent, they're actually slipping back into the old ways. They're slipping back into uh, mystical uh, meditation and devotions and stuff like that. Now, it's not that there's anything wrong with meditation. The, the Bible quite specifically tells us that we should meditate in the Word of God. But this is, in some measure, getting yourself into some sort of trance-like state where you can mystically observe what's happening around about you. It's no really any better than what the Beatles did in the 1960s with transcendental meditation. It's a, it's a method of, of clearing your mind and allowing the, I suppose, the force to be with you, if you want to call it that. But uh, it's something that we really need to be very careful of uh, and, and not to allow ourselves to fall into that, that place. So here she is. And in verse 5 it says, This title was written on her forehead, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the Mother of Prostitutes and of the Abominations of the Earth. Now it's written in capital letters there, in most Bibles, because in the original script, that's what it was written in. It was written in caps in the original script. It wasn't that, that somebody thought, oh, well, we'll just make this a, a, an emboldened part of the scripture. This is actually what was written. Now, the reason that John probably used that was because the Roman prostitutes in the temples in Rome, etc., wore a headband usually with their name on it. And this would be an indication as to exactly who this woman was and what this false religion was, that it was a prostituted religion, that it was a, a, an idolatrous religion. And this takes us back into the study that we did in Genesis when we looked at the, the origins of the false religions. We talk here about mystery, Babylon, the great, the mother of prostitution, the abomination of the earth. Babylon, under Nimrod, if you remember, he was one of the Nephilim. He was one of the, the, the mighty men of valor, it was called, who, were, who was born to the daughter of a man, but was sired by the son of God, a fallen angel. There was a crossover that should never have occurred. It was an absolute abomination before God. And these angels, who were put in chains to await, to await judgment, these are the ones that we spoke about, that I believe that will be allowed out of the abyss in these end times, so that they will wreak their havoc once again across the earth. I mean, the place, this place without God in it, is bad enough with them in it. What's it going to be like without them in it? But we go back to Babylon. Nimrod... Nimrod was the world's first dictator, if you want to call it that. He founded, a, he founded, he founded Babylon uh, in the plain of Shinar on, on the basis of either you either join me or we wipe you out. Basically, that was the sort of that, that was the attitude that he took. And I can see that attitude today beginning to develop in fundamental Muslim Islamists. That you either join us voluntarily or we'll take you out. There seems, to be, there seems to be no middle ground. Now, I can see Islam being part of this, this great false world religion coming as well. But from, from Nimrod, we get a situation that he was married to Semiramis, who the Babylonians worshipped as a moon goddess. Now, they had another god, Sin, which is spelt Sin, S-I-N. But he was the moon god. And we see his sign and her sign, which were both the crescent moon. And you could maybe jot down the number of countries that have got the crescent moon in their, in their flags or in their coat of arms or whatever. But really this is where this has come from. So we got Nimrod who was married to Semiramis Semiramis who had a son called Tammuz who she said had been conceived miraculously if this begins to sound familiar it should because it's a total counterfeit of what, the, what was to come so we get Tammuz who was, who was a totally miraculous conception or an immaculate conception if you want to call it that and uh, what happened to him was that he died. He was, he was a god of, if you want to call it, a god of 
the the earth. He was a god of the vegetation and the plants and the trees, etc. He was a, an earth god, a, a, na- a god of nature, if you want to call it that. And of course, in the winter time, as everything dies back, it was presumed that every year Tammuz died, and he died on the winter solstice. 21st of December the winter solstice and when he died to honour him they would take a log and burn it in the fire and the log was called a yule and yule is Babylonian for child so we got a yule log being burnt in the fireplace on the 21st of December 22nd of December and three days after that Tammuz rose from the dead on the 25th of December. Funnily enough, does this story begin to sound familiar? And in all the and in all the uh, the archaeology that's been dug up, they've actually got loads of stuff. If you want to go and look it up in the British Museum, etc., of uh, pottery and and sort of plates uh, made up, and you can see. Semiramis holding the infant baby Tammuz in her arms with the halo of the moon around her head now the Babylonians believed that Tammuz would be a great saviour to them so we have this picture of a woman holding a baby with a circle of the moon around her head and if that doesn't quite fit the picture I don't know how best else I can put this but this is what has been brought forward from the Babylonian age and has still been brought forward when it came the time that the, 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 the Romans came they took all of this Babylonian nonsense and took it to Rome when Constantine became a Christian a Christian a supposed Christian in about 315 uh, BC AD sorry and uh, of course everybody was told overnight tomorrow uh, Christianity is going to be the the national religion so if you've got a a temple then it can't be the gods that you've had before it can't be Semiramis and Tamas and all the rest of it it's got to be Mary and Joseph and Jesus and whoever else you want to put in there and that was basically very simply put how this spread in and was adopted the Roman Catholicism Semiramis became Mary Jesus became Ta or Tamus became Jesus and uh, basically Nimrod was out of the picture um, and, and in some measure that's what we have today within the Roman Catholicism that God is out of the picture the Father God is out of the picture We've got very much a concentration on Mary and and a baby Jesus. Not a a mighty king, not a king of kings, but a baby Jesus. So you've really got to be careful. And of course one of the things that they did when when, uh, Tammuz was was resurrected on the 25th of December is they went outside and cut down a tree and brought it in and trimmed it and put lights on it to celebrate his resurrection. So, if you're really feeling guilty about Christmas now, so you should. Um, and Samar- Semiramis comes in again in the spring festivals of, of uh, fertility. Um, the little bunny rabbits are there not because they're little bunny rabbits, but because they're a sign of fertility. I mean, we all know the expression, they breed like rabbits. And that's exactly why the, the bunnies were used. And, and the eggs... The, the, the eggs were used because there was another tradition very similar to this, the one that I've just described where, where this goddess Semiramis if you want to call her that or you could call her Ishtar uh, that was another name for her uh, and out of Ishtar comes Ishtar uh, so uh, Easter's not a particularly Christian festival either it's just an adaption of a Babylonian religion so we have to be careful with that as well but it was basically a spring fertility festival now it bears no resemblance to the Jewish Passover festival in which our Lord was crucified it is an 
it is a fake, it is a counterfeit, it's put there basically to deflect the Christian mind in the wrong direction and to make you think that all these things are so goodly and so godly and really at the end of the day they're actually counterfeit. Now Ishtar was uh, our son our son was trapped inside an egg by some evil being and she couldn't get into the egg to let him out so she rolled it down a hill and it broke open and released her son and her son was resurrected from what would have been his tomb and his death now if all these things start to click into place then so they should because it's the same Babylonian story that's repeated endlessly and unfortunately not only the Roman Catholic Church but even the Church of Scotland etc have picked these things up not really knowing what they're doing with them and have just celebrated them anyway we've got this great ecumenical movement going on at the moment it's a it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you believe you know you can all be included and, and in some measure that's a that's a, a <clears throat> what the Roman Catholic Church would term as the, the, the reason for purgatory the reason for purgatory is that you, you'll never be quite perfect or you'll never be quite free of your sin completely so you have to spend some little time in hell but the saints will pray for you and you'll be re- released as soon as possible now that comes about because of the corruption of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ in the matter. That they do a daily mass because the really Roman Catholicism believes that you have to be saved on a daily basis. That every sin that you commit has to be atoned for immediately on a daily basis. Now if you think about it, that heads back into Judaism. Judaism was a religion where daily sacrifice had to be made but then of course Jesus came and said you know once for all your sins are forgiven past, present and future once for all but still we find this mass in it and in some measure it's a method of keeping control over all the people all these, all these mighty waters that this great prostitute sits upon Keeping them in a constant guilt trip that their, you know, that their sins are not forgiven and they have to come to mass and if you miss mass for two or three days and die you'll end up in purgatory. And I, I hate to say this but there are some reformed churches who are starting to preach now what exactly do they call this? It's universalism and it's, it really basically states that that Eventually everybody will be saved. Um, ultimate, ultimate sanctification is another word for it. Eventually everybody will be saved. Yes, yes, you'll have to go to hell, but you'll only have to go to hell for a little while. And then you'll be brought back into having to be with Jesus forever. Now, if that doesn't sound like purgatory, I don't know what it's supposed to be. But believe me, there are churches even in this area that are promoting that type of theology and I'll tell you right now it is absolutely wrong it is just downright wrong but these are the churches who will get involved with this great end times false religion and we say end times it's been around since the beginning we've seen it in Genesis as we go through the Genesis study and we're seeing it now in Revelation but it's coming to an end in Revelation it's, it started in its beginning in Genesis and you'll find that as we work in Genesis and Revelation Sunday morning, Sunday evening that that which has begun in Genesis God will bring to fruition or bring an end in Revelation we've got these two women now who are in the book of Revelation we've got the woman in Revelation chapter 12 who is a type of Israel if you remember us talking about that this woman who was um, chased all over the place by Satan and we've got this woman here in Revelation 17 now we've got we've got four characteristics of each of these women that I've written down here the first characteristic is that they were both mothers the, the, the woman in Revelation 12 who, who was a type of Israel was the mother of the man child the mother of the saviour the true mother of the saviour 
This woman in Revelation 17 is the mother of all harlots, or the mother of all prostitutes, the mother of all false religions, is, is there. Revelation 12, the mother of the man-child would effectively indicate that she was the mother of the true faith. And that Revelation 17 was the mother of all the false faith, uh, faiths. They were dressed, their, their, their mode of dress was another characteristic. In Revelation 12, the woman was, was dressed in heavenly glories given to her by God. And in Revelation 17 we can see that this woman was dressed in worldly splendor. The purple and the scarlet and the, the diamonds and the gold. The influence they had was another characteristic. In Revelation 12 we, that tells us, and it's interesting when you think about what I've just said, that this lady in Revelation chapter 12 had the moon under her feet. In other words, the goddess of the moon was sub- subjected to her. She was, the moon was under her feet. Whereas in Revelation 17 we have find this harlot, this mother of all false religions, has got great sway over all the earthly kings. Another characteristic and the fourth characteristic of these two women is that they were both suffering. Revelation chapter 12 tells us that the woman was attacked by Satan and had to be defended by God to allow this child to come into the world. And we'll see that in Revelation 17 as we go further on in this, that this woman will be attacked by the very kings that she thought she had control over. So that's, I saw at verse 6 here, if we go on just a little bit, I saw at verse 6 that the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of those who bore the testimony of Jesus. So this, this false religion, which will be a strong there will be a strong Roman Catholic influence in it but that will not be the only influence there'll be, this is going to pull together all the false religions of the world there's going to be a great upswelling of, of faith that, that somehow this antichrist and, and this false religion the beast are going to pull it all together and be able to convince the world that they are the best thing to slice bread but you look at this in the, the blood of the saints when you look back into the history of the Roman Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church killed more Christians than all the Roman Empire emperors put together. Indeed, ironically, there was a Pope called Pope Innocent, I think it was Pope Innocent II, and in one afternoon he killed more Christians than any single Roman emperor ever did uh, throughout his whole reign so the biggest single thing that has attacked true Christianity has been the supposed church itself if you didn't conform to their way of thinking and their way of doing things, if you wanted to read the Bible for yourself you can go back to the uh, yeah, studies in chapters 2 and 3 we went into this in quite a bit of depth but you know, if you wanted to read the Bible for yourself it was considered a heresy and you were burned at the stake uh, in the churches themselves the Roman Catholic churches the, the Bibles were chained to the altar so that nobody could come and take them away or open them without the priest's permission and you can see that today I don't know whether you watched any of the, the programs with the mass that was conducted, but I watched it quite intently the other day to try and find out more about what was going on here. But they have, <clears throat> you're allowed to read, you're allowed to read the sort of, um, the letters of Paul, etc., without too much pomp and circumstance, but if you're going to read the Gospels, then there's a great hoo-ha about who reads them and, and, and they've got to be incensed and all the rest of it before they're read etc and that, that is something that, that any man should be able to do and yet this great false religion that is building today towards its climax and uh, this great end times scenario will not allow you to do it's only in the last 40 years 
that Roman Catholics have actually been given permission to read the Bible and very few of them actually do they just take what they're told if you ask a Roman Catholic why they do the rosary they haven't a clue if you ask them why they say their Hail Marys and their Our Fathers they haven't a clue because it's just dead man made religion it's subjection and that alone, that's only going to get worse and I, I don't want to appear here at the moment to be some sort of hater of, of other people or other religions but I'm trying to explain to you exactly what John was prophesying to us that would happen in these times and it, it resonates right through history I'm sure that when, to when there was only a Roman Catholic religion evident that people must have wondered what do all these chapters mean but only when we start to see a reformation of the church are people allowed to read the Bible, study the Bible, look up the Greek and the Hebrew and decide for themselves what the words mean and, and how they're to be translated and then sort of say, well, wait a minute, there's something wrong here. Uh, and of course, you get somebody like uh, the Queen Mary who was the Catholic Queen of England in the 1500s. Bloody Mary, they called her. She had put to death 288 people burned at the stake because of their heretical stance on the Bible in other words they read it for themselves and decided to challenge the church on it and one of the first of them or one of the most famous of them if you've ever read the books of the martyrs was John Rogers and John Rogers stood at the stake in fact he walked to the stake and the French ambassador who was there to witness this this terrible burning at the time the French ambassador said that he walked to his death like a man walking to his wedding he was rejoicing and when they put him on the stake and the flame started to lick up around him he, he rubbed his hands like this as if he was washing his hands in cold water and he lifted up his hands to God and, and burned to death and not, a, not a, a sound came out of his mouth and that was only because he wanted to read the Bible for himself in his own language so if that's what was happening then and it's still very much happening now what's tend to be happening now is that we've not we've not got just translations of the Bible we've got paraphrases of the Bible and the Roman Catholic Church are very good at using these paraphrased Bibles uh, in the sense that they put their spin on it I mean I'm, I'm probably putting spin on this because I'm, I'm actually using a translation it might be the nearly inspired version but it is a translation from the direct uh, original writings where a paraphrased copy is something that somebody has made up that suits their way of thinking I mean if you didn't agree with what I said here I certainly wouldn't burn you at the stake for it uh, or even think about it but towards these end times towards the time when when, uh, when Christ comes back and raptures the church we're going to get more and more of this and basically what happens is that you end up with these paraphrased translations and then you end up with what basically can be termed as prayer books that the church has decided what you should pray and what you should say and what you should read and what you shouldn't read and that to me is what's going to happen here there's going to be such an influence over people that people are going to lap it up this is what we needed this is the end of all these religious things we're all one we're all Joe Tamsin's bairns and everything will be fine and people will lap this type of thing up so this woman who this false religion she was drunk with the blood of the saints and reveling in it the same way as the Roman Catholic Church still is and John says, and this is the vision that John had, When I saw her, I was greatly astonished. Then the angel said to me, Why are you astonished? Now, I believe that John was astonished because he was actually seeing alleged Christians persecuting Christians. He was astonished that this could happen. And the angel said to him, Why are you astonished? I will explain to you the mystery of the woman and the beast she rides, which is seven heads and ten horns. The beast which you saw, and this is where this passage is a wee bit difficult. The beast which you saw 
Once, once was, now is not, and will come up out of the abyss and go to his destruction. The inhabitants of the earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the creation of the world will be astonished when they see the beast because he once was, now is not, and yet will come. So even us who sit in heaven and observe this will be astonished at this beast who once was, now is not, and yet will come. Now there's a riddle for you. And in verse 9 it says, This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. And of course anybody that knows their geography, Rome was built originally on what? Seven hills. There are also seven kings. Five have fallen. One is. The other has not yet come. But when he does come, he must remain for a little while. The beast who once was and now is not is an eighth king. He belongs to the seven and is going to his destruction. Now the eighth king there they're talking about is death. That, that's the Antichrist. There's no question that's his empire. It'll only be for a short time and then it'll be gone again. Now there's a, there's a bit of um, problem here. Uh, if you don't read this along with Daniel as well. Because it says here that the seven heads are also seven kings. Five have fallen. One is and the other has not yet come now. The empires that impacted upon Israel up until even today were originally Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persian Empire, the Greeks, and the Romans. Then is that? Six. And then of course, out of that what Daniel calls the fourth empire will arise another empire with ten kings who will be part of that and that we can look at in Daniel 7 I'll just read you this in Daniel 7 if, uh, I know that it's a bit difficult in this Daniel 7 In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions passed through his mind and he was lying on his bed and he wrote down the substance of his dream. And Daniel said, In my vision at night I looked and there before me were the four winds of heaven churning up the great sea. Four great beasts, each different from the others, came up out of the sea. The first was like a lion and had the wings of an eagle. I watched until its wings were torn off and it was lifted from the ground so that it stood on two feet like a man and the heart of a man was given to it. And there before me was a second beast which looked like a bear. It was raised up in one of its sides and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. It was told, get up and eat your fill of flesh. After that I looked and there before me was another beast, one that looked like a leopard. And on its back it had four wings like those of a bird. This beast had four heads and it was given authority to rule. And after that in my vision at night I looked and there before me was a fourth beast, terrifying and frightful and very powerful it had large iron teeth that crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left it was different from all the other former beasts and it had ten horns right now in Daniel chapter 2 we have this great big statue that Nebuchadnezzar built of the the golden head and the silver shoulders and the bronze chest etc etc now that basically covered four of these empires because the golden head Daniel tells us was Babylon so Egypt and Assyria are missed off of Daniel's list but they're on this list so when we talk about coming out of the fourth empire don't, don't think that it's the fourth empire here it's the fourth empire out of Daniel's bits and pieces here so Egypt and Assyria so we've got Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greeks and Rome and this, this last beast, this last beast that Daniel talks about will be apparently a revival of some sort of Roman Empire. In Daniel 2, it tells us that this great statue that Nebuchadnezzar built, if I can find Daniel chapter 2 again, um, that Nebuchadnezzar built, it's feet of iron and clay mixed 
They're very fragile. The iron is very strong, the clay is very, very brittle. So it could be broken up very readily. But n- broken up into its constituent parts, but the constituent parts would not be broken from each other. But it says here that while you were watching, this is, this is the dream that, of the statue that, that, that Nebuchadnezzar built. While you were watching, a rock was cut not by human hands and it struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Now, what are feet made up of? Toes. How many toes of two feet got? Ten. How many kings are going to come up with this last in this last uh, area here when the, when the beast rises to power the beast becomes a, a, a king over all these ten kingdoms the ten kingdoms give up their power to the beast and this great stone that's going to arise and capture the whole earth according to Daniel is, is the Christ child it's the, it's the coming of Christ and it's going to come down and crash upon the feet and smash the feet to pieces and therefore defeat the Antichrist in the end, the, the battle of Armageddon at the end. So we've got this here. Five have fallen, one is not, the other has not yet come, but when he does come, he must remain for a little while. The beast who once was and now is is an eighth king. He belongs to the seven and is going to his destruction. So he belongs to the seven when we talk about the seven great empires. This eighth great empire will be the empire, the global, literally a global empire of the Antichrist. The ten horns you saw, verse 12, are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but who for one hour will receive authority as kings along with the beast. Now we know from Daniel that out of the fourth kingdom, which is the Roman kingdom, that this, these ten kingdoms are going to rise. We're looking at it, many people have looked at it from the point of view of the economic union, the EEC or whatever we want to call it nowadays, the common market, old hat. But there's certainly going to be some rise in, in ten kingdoms out of what was the old Roman Empire. The old Roman Empire was never defeated. It just sort of faded away. So as it rises again, we now have, I think, 27 adherents to the Treaty of Rome and that's a, an interesting point as well that the European Union signed the Treaty in Rome and it became of course the Treaty of Rome but we're going to have a situation here where ten of these countries or ten areas or whatever it is are going to rise up as a great block who are going to support the government the, the one world government the Antichrist and this great religion that goes with it and they will give their authority to the beast and verse 14 they will make war against the lamb but the lamb will overcome them because he is lord of lords and king of kings and with him will be his called chosen and faithful followers so when that end battle comes when Christ comes to rule and reign in the earth you and I will be with him now those who have different places about where they want to put the rapture to me in the last time it would be a bit it seems a bit silly to me that, that you have a rapture where you go straight up and straight back down again you know, it's, uh, because you've got to come with him so uh, if he catches us on the way down he's got to bring us back down again so you can help him do a lot of yo-yo um, but again it's it's where do you accept that you've been saved from? We all talk about being saved. But what have we been saved from? This is what we're being saved from. And what is this? This is God's wrath. That's what we've been saved from. Oh yes, we, we may be saved from the devil and we'll, we'll, we'll be certainly been saved from our sins. But we've been reconciled to God so that at the end of the times we do not stand judged before God. We stand and his righteousness as, as a people who have been exempted from all this terrifying tribulation that's going on it would seem a bit strange that God would save them from his, from his wrath and then put us through it just, just to be awkward so the angel said to me sorry 
They will make war against the Lamb, but the Lamb will overcome them because He is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And with Him will be His called, chosen, and faithful followers. In verse 15, Then the angel said to me, The waters you saw where the prostitute sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. So we've got the whole world included here, an international coalition of false religion. And this great, this great prostitute who perverts everything is, is ruling over it. And the angel said to me, the waters you saw where the prostitute sits are peoples, multitudes, nations and languages. The beast and the ten horns you saw will hate the prostitute. Isn't it always the same that people who are in positions of power will use religion as a lever to get them where they want to be and then when they get there they dump it? How many prime ministers and presidents have we seen who stood up and proclaimed Christ as their Lord and Saviour and then as soon as they get into power, oh well I never actually said that. that that's not exactly what I meant. So there will be a turn, and that's why I'm, I'm saying that this religion will fall flat on its face in the middle of the tribulation, because that's when the, the, the great Antichrist will proclaim himself to be God. I am your God, you don't need this religion anymore. And of course, the, the people who are practicing this religion will take hell out of it, because they'll not be able to make the money, etc., that they did in the past. They will bring her to ruin, that's this great religion and leave her naked, and they will eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to accomplish his purpose by agreeing to give the beast their power to rule until God's words are fulfilled. And I think that sums it all up in that sense. That all of this, it's not random events. We need, we need not worry when we see the world declining. We should rejoice because Christ is coming soon. The more, the more tyranny and anarchy and, and chaos that we see in the world, the, the closer we are to Christ coming back. And this is all in God's will. God is allowing this to happen so that he can bring his final judgment upon it. And that these people will suffer for it. The false religion will be the first to go. And then these ten kings will go as they come into battle against the Lamb of God. And so will the beast. The woman you saw, and here we are, sorry, so, sorry, I'll read verse 17 again. For God has put it into their hearts to accomplish his purpose by agreeing to give the beast their power to rule until God's words are fulfilled. And it's something that I sort of major on at times, and I said this morning, that God will never make you do what you don't want to do. And what you want to do, truly in your heart, he will never stop you from doing. That's the great beauty or the great irony of God. He wants you because you want to serve him. He doesn't want to force you. This, this alternative religion will force you to worship the beast and worship the ten kings and give your authority over to him. But God is never in that business. If your true heart's desire is to do something against his will, he will let you do it. But beware you suffer the consequences for it. It's not that he'll end up beating you over the head with a rolling pin or whatever. He's a great and a gracious and forgiving God. And if you go back and ask for forgiveness, forgiveness will be given to you. But beware, these people were totally against all that was God. Everything that was called God. And I want to read you just a couple of scriptures out of Jeremiah just to finish off here. Because if you think that what was said about the Babylonian religion was, was something... Uh, that kind of I pulled out a book or moved around somewhere. He, here, here's here's a here's some out Jeremiah chapter seven. Now this was at a point where the children of Israel were totally apostate. They were they had gone away from God completely, but they they still thought that they were serving God. But they had moved like this end times religion moved so far away that it was that it was unrecognizable. But it says here in Jeremiah 7, verse 18, The children gather wood, the, fire, the fathers light the fire, and the women knead the dough and make cakes of bread for the Queen of Heaven. Who do, who do we know now today as the Queen of Heaven? And that's in a derogatory sense. If you go to Jeremiah 44, I think, I hope, 
Jeremiah 44, verse 17 and verse 25. You can read the whole passage for yourself. We will, the people said, we will certainly do everything we said we would. We will burn incense to the Queen of Heaven and will pour out our drink offerings to her, just as our fathers, our kings and our, our kings and our officials did in the towns of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. And if I think, if I can remember it right, there's a scripture in Ezekiel chapter 8 that rebukes the people as well for the way they worship and bring idolatry into the temple. And he says here, I'm not, the sixth year and the sixth month of the fifth day, while I was sitting in my house, the elders of Judah were sitting before me, the hand of the sovereign Lord came upon me there and I looked and I saw a figure that looked like a man from what appeared to be his waist down he was fire and from there up was an appearance as if bright glowing metal so this was his uh, his view of Jesus Christ and uh, I was trying to find the verse now I was looking for but there's basically a verse there that says that at the north gate Look towards the north, so I look to it, why? Is it verse, verse what? Three. What does verse three say? Right. And there's quote where the rose jealousy. There is a reference here in this passage, I'm quite sure, to the people, and Ezekiel rebukes them, for the women were sitting at the gate and weeping for Tammuz verse 13, verse 13. Go and read it first then Linda. and he said to me turn again and you will see greater abominations that they are doing for he brought me to the door of the north gate of the Lord's house and to my dismay women were sitting there weeping for Tammuz Tammuz so even in that time Tammuz was prominent now it has become a, 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 a disparaging image of Jesus Christ a false image this Tammuz the saviour who is the false messiah only Jesus is the true messiah next week we'll look at the commercial Babylon because at the last verse there it says verse 18 in chapter 17 the woman you saw is the great city that rules over the kings of the earth so you've got two here you've got this great false religion and this great commercial enterprise that's going to come to know let's pray Father, we just thank you for your word tonight. We thank you, Lord, that, that you show us these things. Not that we should be taken by surprise, Lord. Not that, not, not that the thief that comes in the night can take us by surprise, Lord. That we know these things. We see the signs of the times, Lord. And, and we pray that your time would come soon, Lord. That it would soon be time for us to be out here, Lord, and to be with you. So, Father, we say, come soon, Lord Jesus. And Lord, we thank you. Enlighten our hearts, Lord. Whatever this study has been in me, Lord, erase it from our minds. And whatever is from you, Lord, let it be burned into our hearts, Lord. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.